Well, I really appreciate being here. I, 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 a little bit of a disclosure, a couple of disclosures. I, this is some of the things I've done. I also delivered a <coughs> lecture very similar to this to the reimbursement conference at, in New Orleans a little while ago. So if you were at that one, this is going to be redundant and you're free to go. In fact, you're free to go anyway. <laughs> if you, there's a lot of y'all out there it's making me nervous. First thing I need to talk about is the difference between a freestanding emergency center and a hospital outpatient department, and it's kind of a big difference. Freestanding emergency, well, we'll start with HOPDs. An HOPD is a freestanding ER, and to a patient it'll look exactly the same, but it's a freestanding building that they go in and get emergency care in. The difference is that it's licensed by the hospital, and that makes the whole structure of it from everything outside of the patient care part different than a, a freestanding ER. It's also recognized by CMS. I guess this doesn't work. Which means you can take CMS patients and get paid in a freestanding emergency center. You cannot. HOPDs are generally created to, to expand the geographic footprint of a hospital or a hospital system. They're very popular. They're growing up all over the country right now. And, and it's a direction, I think, that freestanding emergency centers are also going in terms of partnering with hospitals. Freestanding emergency center is an independent, non-hospital affiliated emergency department. So to the patient, it'll look exactly the same as a, as a HOPD. But it's built and owned by physicians, although the, the majority of them now are owned by non-physicians. And there's one public company that does freestanding emergency centers and does it all across the country. Uh, in Texas, we, we were sort of the pioneers on it, and we drove this law through the legislature over two sessions. It's Title 25, Chapter 131 of the Administrative Code. Title 25, ch Chapter 133 defines hospitals. So it's two complete uh, separate rules and regulations and laws that define what's an HOPD and what's a, a freestanding ER. It has unique intolerance requirements and unique reimbursement issues. And of course, it's not recognized by CMS, which means you can't get paid for CMS patients. They show up, we do see them, but you're not getting paid for them. It tends to be free care. Here's our second building. This is a 20,000 square foot building. I wanna change speeds a little bit here and talk about ambulatory surgery centers, because I think freestanding ERs and ambulatory surgery centers are following a nearly identical track in how they grew out and what forced them to grow out and why I think that um, freestanding ERs are here to stay and are never going away. And I hope to convince all of you that to be true by the end of this talk. And so we're gonna digress a little bit. Uh, ASCs grew, grew out of the same reason freestanding ERs did, because physicians wanted to, ha to have control of their own reimbursement and patients liked them. And so they went together in 1970, two dudes named Reed and Ford and somewhere in Arizona started a, a, an ambulatory surgery center. I don't even know what kind of doctors they were. They opened it in 1970. By, by 1975, there were 42. As a comparison in freestanding ERs, the first one was about 2006. By 2010, there's several hundred of them. It took 12 years for Medicare to recognize ASCs by producing um, 200 different procedure codes that would be reimbursable inside that building. There are now 2,000, almost half of all the procedure codes that are available in a hospital are also available in an ASC. There are 5,300 ASCs in the country. That's a little more than one per hospital. And I think that's an important number because if you look at saturated markets in Houston for freestanding ERs, there's about one per hospital. So I, I believe that once mature, there will be about one freestanding ER for every hospital there is in the country. And they're not gonna be um, spread thinly either. It's gonna be just like hospitals where there's lots of money and lots of people, there are gonna be lots of freestanding ERs. And when there's, where it's rural, they're not gonna be as much. That economic pressure won't change. And the newest data I could find on this, which is government data, was 2011, and about half the ASCs were physician-owned. I think that that's less true in the case of freestanding ERs. There's probably more than half are non-physician-owned. Um, they get paid at a, at a Medicare rate of 65%. So a colonoscopy in an ASC gets paid 65% of the colonoscopy done in a hospital, all other things being equal. 
And I think that trend in a differential reimbursement perspective will occur in freestanding ERs. If you look at the actual dollars collected, you know, the billings are the same. We bill about the same as a hospital would for, a, for an ED service, but the collections are less. So whether or not there's sort of a outside forces that are making it less, that's a reality of it. And I think at the end of the day, people in the freestanding ER business will accept that less is okay and that less is probably the right. Our acuity is less too. Um, ASCs also have a better safety record than hospitals, most likely related to acuity. And of course, patient satisfaction is a lot better. I can't imagine going to get a colonoscopy in a hospital. I don't think any rational person would. A little bit, we're going to swing back to freestanding ERs. This is, um, the, I'm sorry, we're still on ASCs. This is the total number of ASCs and where they're distributed around the country. I just thought it was an interesting slide. The most interesting was, was this state, which I think is Vermont. Is it? New That's New Hampshire? You know, they're all the same. <laughs> so from Texas, that state is called New England. <laughs> So this little county in England, it only has one, whereas this county next door, it has 24. I have no idea why, but I thought it was interesting. New Hampshire, I have to remember that. <laughs> I'm gonna read this to you because this is nearly identical to the, to the kinds of sentences and phrases that were said about ambulatory surgery centers in 1975 and 78. Critics say that freestanding ER operators business's strategy is to cherry pick privately insured patients in a more affluent suburban and, and ex-urban communities who want, to care, who want care access closer to their homes and while steering sicker and lower income patients to traditional hospital emergency departments. They're very good at targeting areas with people with higher incomes with good insurance, Ho said. Now, we're in, we're in Nevada, so I know what a hoe is, but I do not know <laughs> this, I do not know this guy. <laughs> it, was just, it came out of modern healthcare. Anybody that smiles at me is. I learned that. <laughs> and th those kinds of words were exactly the same back in the ASC days. That's when I was going to medical school and and early residency years, the ASCs were popping up, and those exact words were there, it's the same. The fact is that didn't happen. There, there is some validity to the, the HOPDs, I'm sorry, ASCs snatch up you know, patients with more money and hospitals have less, but it's more true that, that, that hospitals take care of the ones that are tougher and sicker, and ASCs take care of the ones that are less tough and less sick. That same exact trend is happening on the freestanding ER side. I think it all started back when this got published, which is October of 2004, I think. Um, and this guy wrote an article about how dangerous it is to be in an emergency room. And we see these kinds of articles today. So this kind of public mindset about what, what an ER is and how bad they are exists today. The text in the article is actually pretty good. Um, but the, what I found was really cute was that you need this article to see how to survive. So here's how you survive. First of all, you must know how to read. Preferably like a magazine or a newspaper. Or you have to be able to watch somebody else reading. So if you see like this gal, she's watching him and he's, she's watching her. Oh, what these two are. Oh, this guy's definitely watching this one. <laughs> so that's really all there is to it. You just got to know how to read. What struck me funny was there's no sick people in this screen at all, really. So I'm not sure they needed advice on survival. Everybody has seen this slide. This is the number of emergency department beds that have been, re been shrinking for the past couple of decades. This probably has leveled off now. I haven't seen newer data than this. <laughs> we, we just got regaled by Dr. Clower on the, the uh, workforce reduction that was going to have, and on my, by my data, there's uh, 90,000 fewer doctors than needed in 2020. He, I think he had 100,000 in 2025. So there's, it's a very real problem. There won't be enough physicians. Love this slide, actually. This is, the, this is the number of visits to an ER. This is the number of primary care physicians per 100,000. 
It starts with 25 doctors per 100,000 up to 125. So the more pro primary care doctors there are, the less people go to the ER. Since we know there are not, this is, this, this is getting worse, we know this number's going up. And the 150 million number that uh, we heard yesterday is a very real number on how many people are gonna show up in the ER and it is not gonna keep going down. There's nobody else to take care of them. There's also major changes, and I'll get to it in a little bit, about how much, you know, how insurance is changing and how the Affordable Care Act is, has made um, moderate chaos into severe chaos. This is just a slide about other things people are going to the ER for, which we already all know. I don't think there's a dentist shortage. Back to the freestanding ERs. There's, it's a fact that the freestanding ER is an independent practice of emergency medicine. It's very compelling for an emergency physician to get to do this. If you got a little bit of entrepreneurial you know, spirit and a couple of three, four million bucks, you can build one of your own. So the, the bar to get in is kind of high, but it's very doable for a group of two or three doctors. One physician can get funded for one through most banks. This is our waiting room and our first one. That's what it looks like when we're busy, also. The only time people are sitting in our waiting room is because their, their wife is in the back and he's watching sports on that TV. I had one patient come in and the wife had a kidney stone. She was back there for a while, got better, hydrated, pain relief. She came out, let's go. He said, we can't go now. It's the fourth quarter. <laughs> they left. So it creates a diversity and a revenue stream for which uh, I, me anyway was stuck in, in provider uh, based fee reimbursement for our group. It's an independent practice of emergency medicine and it's an entrepreneurial opportunity for not just doctors but for a lot of people. And I, before we're done here, I'll prove to you that it's a great opportunity. They're not really gonna go away. They're not gonna go away because there's a shortage of PCPs and it's gonna drive people to the emergency room. It's gonna drive poor people and rich people to the emergency room. And every, there's not, not a single person in this room or any room who would gladly sit in a, in a waiting room packed filled with people that uh, weren't necessarily sick in your view where you had to wait several hours while little kids were blowing snot bubbles out of their nose and eating Cheetos. That's the kind of environment that none of us like. And this, avoids that environment. So people will come here, and they are coming here, and this is an easy choice to do, and it will be a real choice in the future. Um, we saw that there's a decreasing number of ER beds in the country. Um, large ED volume growth, we are seeing it with the Affordable Care Act. It was very predictable with the Affordable Care Act. Not enough doctors, a lot more insurance. People are going to the ER. It's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, patients love our facilities not just ours, but freestanding ERs in general. There's no wait, everybody has the opportunity to be nice. There's no pressure for efficiency. In fact, we actively discourage efficiency in our ERs. All of the things you've heard about being efficient today are all great when you're seeing 550 patients a day. My record in, the, in an ER was 301. But 500 patients, we don't have, we could care less about efficiency. It's actually detrimental to be efficient. What you should do is be inefficient, but attentive. So we encourage attentiveness. Sit down, talk to the patient, find out everything you wanna know about their life. They love that. If you, if you do stuff too fast, they think it costs too much for the period of time you gave them. So if somebody comes in with a Collie's fracture and you x-ray it and you reduce it, which we do, and you splint it, and you do that all in, in 60 minutes or 50 minutes, and then they get a bill for, for a fracture reduction that's several thousand dollars, they think that was, they got ripped off. Wouldn't have bothered them in an orthopedist's office waiting several hours, though. And I also believe at the end of the day, they're gonna be cheaper. This one's dying. It's, the codes and the, and the prices for them is, are just gonna be cheaper. Our admission rate runs around 6%. So less than half of the national average for hospitals. Mission rate for urgent cares runs around point something percent. So we're significantly sicker than them, but, not, but much less sick than the hospital. 
We've seen an explosive growth in regional saturation, especially in Texas, Colorado. It's happening in Arizona. It's, it's beginning in um, Florida, it's, uh, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma. So it's coming and it's coming very fast. Um, the the oper creation and operation of them have definitely outpaced the, me the media views, especially social media, because you, they, that, that kind of information fires really fast. And one angry person who got an angry bill or didn't get Vicodin or Demerol or whatever he wanted, that information will, will go out really fast. And most of the people that are, uh, are attending to this kind of environment are social media savvy. So we get most of our patient referrals through the internet, over 50%. The payer pushback is substantially gone. In the beginning, there was significant payer pushback that this wasn't, a li this wasn't licensed in the beginning, we didn't have a license, or it's not a licensed hospital, or it's not that. Now, Blue Cross, for example, has a whole uh, section of their negotiating uh, department that only deals with negotiating rates for freestanding ER. So it's pretty much now mainstream accepted inside the, uh, the uh, insurance industry. Uh, there is still legislative pushback. There's still some legislators. We had one orthopedic surgeon who it's still in Texas who just hates freestanding ERs and we don't know why, but he hates them. I maybe had a patient that went to one and had a bad outcome and anyway, so he, he's always trying to fight it and propose legislation that kills it. He, everybody else on his committee is exactly the opposite, and it's likely that he'll lose his job before they lose theirs. But they're still, it, it's just like balance billing. It's a constant work effort that has to happen. On the national scale, it's, even, it's a little more different, and that's related a little bit to certificate of need and, then, and that uh, sort of era of back, that goes back into the 1960s when certificate of need and the uh, Medicare were both introduced and CON was created in every state to limit the number of hospitals that got built because we were, they were afraid at the time of all the cost explosions that would occur once Medicare was enacted into law. CON has since evolved into a, a mechanism for monopolies. And so it's really a way for a, a, a hot, an established system to have and keep their monopoly. There are massive consolidations going on in healthcare. I'm not even gonna talk about that at all. And that's absolutely happening in the freestanding ER world. Every day is a little bit different from the monopoly perspective. To the patients, they, they don't really, they haven't connected generally the difference between a freestanding ER and an urgent care. Even though we have laws in Texas that, that have to have the word emergency. You have to have them sign all kinds of documents. They understand it. it's an emergency. They almost passed a, a rule in the last session that said they had to sign a piece of paper that said, I understand this is not an urgent care center, even though the word emergency is everywhere. That one didn't make it. They don't really understand hospital-based billing and technical side. They don't understand that at all. Um, they, don't, they do not understand that their copay is different if they're in an emergency room versus seeing their doctor or at an urgent care center. Uh, deductibles have skyrocketed in the past two years. Now it's routine to have a five or $10,000 deductible, which means it might take you till September or October to use up your deductible, whereas three years ago, your deductible be used up in January. And that's a big issue on the billing side, and patients are not understanding that. Most of us don't understand that, quite honestly, in the healthcare world. And I mentioned that short visits don't, generally speaking, we call all of our patients twice. We call them three days after they came, or within three days after they came, and a doctor or a nurse calls them and asks them how they're doing. It's part of our patient satisfaction process, and we can do that because our volumes are low. Um, a day or two after that, we call them and we say, explain medical billing is very complicated and you're going to get a bunch of pieces of information that will make it even more complicated. You'll get an EOB from your insurance company. You'll get a bill from us. You may get a bill from our radiologist that read your film, uh, on and on. But what we want to do is make sure you understand it completely and we'll work through it with you. Um, they're happy until they actually start getting that information. Then they're, then they're not so happy because they don't, they don't realize that emergency medicine is expensive. If they've been to a hospital before, then they understand. 
So there is a big threat, you know, the in hospitals and, in, and insurance companies and Medicare. I talked to the Medicare guy, I got invited to the White House a year, a little over a year ago, and he said, we're not gonna create a new way to pay doctors. I said, it's not a new way, they're gonna go to an ER somewhere, you're just gonna pay us or you're gonna pay the, the neighborhood hospital. He said, we're not doing it. Uh, they, they will eventually. Anyway, so Kaiser thinks that there's a wildfire growth about f freestanding ERs. Florida, which is the most um, oppressive CON state that I'm aware of. I mean, you can't even get medical permission to change your underwear in Florida without this, the committee making a decision about that. I was just kidding about the underwear. You can actually change your underwear if you want to. <laughs> but you can't add a bed. If you've got a 10 bed ER and you want a 12 bed ER, you've got to have a CON permission to do that. You want to add an ultrasound machine to your ER, you've got to have permission. It's, they now have freestanding ERs in Florida. In fact, these are all of the CON states. Purple means CON, yellow means not CON. The yellow is growing and the purple is shrinking over the past decade. We are now at, I think, 34, 34 or 35 states are CON and the rest are not. If you're not in a CON state, then the freestanding ER is a very real possibility because then all you need is a licensing law. Tex the Texas law is now in the, um, there's a agency or a, a organization that models laws for, for state legislatures and they have snapped ours up and ours turned out to be pretty good. But you can see where the freestanding ERs are going to start popping up. Hospitals have a love-hate relationship with us for sure. They love the, fa they love the HOB concept because it's theirs, it's their licensed property, which means a lot of the freestanding ERs are now going to joint venture HOPD models. And a big chunk of them in Colorado are now joint venture HOPD models where the hospital owns 51% which satisfies CMS uh, ownership requirements and then the physicians own the other 49% so that they can share revenue. They love funded admissions. These, these facilities are built in places where most of the patients are funded. You wouldn't build one in a place that isn't funded. St. Luke's, which is a non-for-profit in Houston, doesn't build hospitals where there's any poor people. If you look at the city of San Antonio, there's a I-10 runs right through the middle of it. All the rich people live north, the poor people live south. It's full of nonprofits. The whole city is a nonprofit, San Antonio. Every hospital is north of I-10. It's just reality. That's where, that's where they're gonna get built. Um, so our admissions tend to be funded. One admission per day from, an HOP, from a freestanding ER to a hospital it equals $4.4 million of bottom line earnings. So that CEO is gonna take home 4.4 million bucks per one admission per day. And it, and it grows their area. They hate freestanding ERs because we're physician competitors until we're built. And then once we're built, then we're admitting a patient or two a day and they're making a lot of money on us. They don't like losing patient control. They don't like giving physicians control. They don't like doctors with leverage, especially ER doctors, that any, any provider with leverage they, they're not fans of. We, we are definitely competitors, and it, it could lose, they could lose money from it. I know a hospital CEO, we actually just hired him to run all of ours, and he ran a, he ran a freestanding ER in uh, the Houston area, and they made five million bucks a year on 20 Medicaid patients a day. So it was a very lucrative book of business for that hospital. And we can, and we can definitely do better than that. That was Medicaid, Medicaid. So they love the admission. We, we saw earlier that this 60% number of admissions coming from emergency medicine is probably a small number. We, and, and I think healthcare reform will we'll drive it even more into our, into our buildings. This is the law that was passed, House Bill 1357. It took us two sessions to drive. It's seven pages long. There's seven pages that outlines how you license a freestanding ER. I show you that. That's, this is the, uh, the regulations that were put forward. I show you that because I want to show you this page, which is the last page, number 160. So they turned a seven page law into 160 pages of regulations. And they took most of the hospital regulations in the state of Texas are 212 pages. 
So the amount of, the f amount of stuff we have to do and the amount of hump loops that we have to go through to build a freestanding ER is very similar to a hospital. In fact, most of our buildings can be licensed as a hospital. It also costs a lot more. I'm going to fly through this reimbursement because I'm running out of time and because it's just about as boring as it can be. It, it, I think Mike Gronofsky left so I can badmouth reimbursement. It's no problem. <laughs> it's like a hospital. You've got to have a technical component and a professional component. Um, the, the, there's all the stuff about copays, uh, deductibles, coinsurance, and stuff that you've got to collect in the front desk. We exist almost exclusively out of network, and almost all freestanding ERs do now. Um, we have seen pressure from the hospitals who had pressured us for many years to be in network. We still still have a couple of hospitals. Now are okay with us being out of network because the Affordable Care Act kind of changed the way in and out of network is perceived. Anyway, we are entirely out of network, and so there's a, the billing process is now a lot more complicated. The appeals are a lot longer. The days in AR are a lot longer. Um, the out-of-pocket for the patient legally is, should be the same as if they were in network, but you have to work to get it there. Uh, coders are important because you need a, you need a well, it's, it's no different than a hospital-based chart. Um, if you're not familiar with the technical side, coding and collecting, then you should get an expert that is or find a billing company that is because traditional emergency medicine does not have experience on the hospital side. The hospital side collects about five times more money than the profi side, so it's really the important side to be good at. Medicare, you cannot charge Medicare or treat or uh, send them a, a, a bill. What happens is Medicare patients come into us, we see them for free, and then we have a little a mini lecture to tell them we were happy to take care of them, but we're not going to get paid ever. And in these kinds of neighborhoods, that usually pisses them off. Well, they'll say, no problem, I'll just pay cash, or I'll just pay with my credit card. And then you say, no, I don't, I don't, you, we, you can't do that either because I don't look good in a jumpsuit. That's what you wear in federal prison, by the way. Um, well, you can charge the pro fee, but we generally don't. We find that it is really good advertising to see seniors, and we think one day we, uh, we will. Here's the last slide, and here's the main reason why freestanding ERs are not going to go away. So this is a hypothetical PO, uh, p and that uh, assumes 15 patients a day. If you drop this number by half, I'll get to that in a minute. Your, pay, your technical revenue, that's on the hospital side, at a conservative $1,600 a patient. In the United States, on the hospital side, it's $2,200 a patient in the United States. So if we only collect $1,600 a patient, and on the profi side, it's $250. $250 is going to seem like a high number for a lot of you guys, but there's no Medicare, no Medicaid, and very little self-pay. And most of our self-pay is Medicare that, we, that didn't pay us. So most of the patient, the total reimbursement for us is close to $2,000 a patient. So that generates $832,500 of revenue. If you look down on the expenses side, it's kind of expensive. You've got to have nurses, you've got to have techs, you've got to have a big building. You're generally sitting on a 10 to 20,000 square foot building that costs three, four hundred $400 a square foot to build. It's loaded with equipment. You must have a CAT scanner, ultrasound. You must have all of these things in there, so it's not cheap to have. Uh, plus, you've got to have physician labor there, and at 15 patients a day, the profi side will not support the physician side at, at the rates of pay that we get in Texas. Um, so I threw in banking, marketing, administrative. That's, I put that one in there because that's how I get paid, and I just want to make sure it's in the spreadsheet. 400 grand a month is a very typical number that you'll be paying every month to pay for one of the freestanding ERs. So at 15 patients a day, your earnings are $432,000 a month. That's uh, $6 million a year, five-something million dollars a year on 15 patients a day. So that's why efficiency is completely unimportant. These 15 need to be really happy to send you 15 more. I mean, we've hit 60 patients a day in one of our ERs. 